for being here with us today. Of course, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a, uh, is it sunny for you in the city? That's good. It's nice and sunny and lovely here too. So I'm just yeah. appreciating that right now because it'll probably be like nice and then it'll be April and we'll get horrible, terrible weather because um, Ontario is fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, so in case I'll give a little intro in case there's people that don't know what the heck this is. Um, last year, kind of when things were looking like they were going to be shut down for a pretty long time, Kyle and I decided that we wanted to do something to still connect with people that have stayed here or people that we've worked with in the past. And it started with a conversation with a printmaking pal, uh, Josh Dannon. And we were talking about like, what could we talk about? And the idea of like having artwork just kind of stored in flat files in print shops is, is pretty commonplace. It's not a very unusual thing. So we thought it would be fun if we just kind of went through our flat files and then shared some work. That way we could talk about Josh, talk about projects that maybe he's working on and a little bit about his shop, but then also kind of spread that love a bit further and talk about other people whose work we really admire and appreciate. So it's not only like, been really interesting but it's kind of expanded our um like collection because we've been investing in some of the pieces that people have brought up because for the most part it seems like all artists are very um captured by affordable art <laughs> and trading and people that are open to that kind of exchange um so it's been a nice like show and tell but also getting to you know, be what well, everybody loves to be a little bit snoopy and see people's studios and learn a little bit more about their practice. So yeah, so we call it flat files and it's just inviting someone on. So we'll start with a little tour and little chat about you and then we'll do um, a little show and tell near the end. And yeah, they run until they are they feel like they're at a good closing point and then we leave and it's pretty informal and casual. <laughs> yeah. So if you can introduce yourself, Sandy, that would be great. And talk a little bit about your practice. Yeah, I'm Sandy Hughes. I'm based in Toronto. Um, I've always called myself a painter, which is funny because I feel like I, I was thinking about it the other day. And I'm like, I have really painted like oil paintings in a, in a while. My practice is diverse into a few different areas for about two years. Um, but I kind of still think of everything. Oh, your audio is cutting in and out. I don't know if you have headphones you could put. Have, oh, like, you're on. These little, these little guys. Can you hear me better now? Yeah. Okay. I think it's just my hair. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, everything I do, I come at from the view of a painter. So I started working on two-dimensional sculpture a number of years back, um, plaster, plaster and fiber sculpture. And I've been doing a lot of fiber work over the last couple of years. Um, mostly what I've been working on now is paperwork, um, ink drawings mostly, but I kind of approach everything like an oil painting. So I still think of myself that way, even though I haven't touched oil paint in like a couple of years, really. I can sympathize with that, actually. Mm -hmm. Because I haven't painted in forever. I mean, like, really painted, painted. Um, but I still really think of myself as a painter. Like, I can't seem to separate from that headspace. Well, I think it's the way you kind of conceive of work and the way you layer things always, for me, is really related to oil painting. Um, and I've been working on sculpture and fiber for a while, but then I also got pregnant and oil painting. Like, you can still oil paint when you're pregnant, but it's sort of one of those things that's on the line. So I was like, yeah. mm, I don't really like working wearing a respirator every day. So I yeah. kind of lean into the other parts of my practice. So. Uh, it was really handy that I already had those things going, so. Can you talk a little bit about that series of work? Because it, I really like how it sort of has, like, uh, a few of them have a very, like, tapestry-type feel. But then others, because you're using more of, like, a sculptural material, um, there's this sort of... Um, interesting relationship between, like, the weight of that sculpture, but it still feels very textile-based, even when it's not fabric. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I started doing those when I was in living in Berlin, and I spent a few months living in Athens um, while I was doing, I, I won an award called the Joseph Plotkin Award for Painting, 
uh, which is this incredible award that gives you money to travel around Europe for a year, um, making work and um, doing research. Um, I got that just at the end of my grad school. So I went from grad school pretty quickly to Europe and I ended up staying there for a few years, actually ended up relocating for a while. Um, but I had been working on ink drawings, mostly kind of paperwork while I was doing these residencies abroad. And I was in Athens and trying to think about, like I was about to get a studio in Berlin and have some time to work on a show and have like proper studio space again. And I'm like, now that I'm leaving this transient phase of my work, I really want to add a sense of depth and material to the work. But um, everything I've been making was so different from the oil paintings I've been making back in Canada. And I realized part of that was because I was so separated from the landscape that were the basis of my work. My work has been really grounded in landscape tradition for a long time. Um, and I've been doing all these drawings from these sculptural reliefs in Athens. Um, and they were these incredible things that were worn down by centuries of decay and war, but they had these really relatable gestures of people um, and land together, like people in the market square sort of like embracing or passing each other things. And I started making a lot of drawings of those. And when I was going back to Berlin, I'm like, how do I add this sort of sense of material history to something? Uh, like I want to be able to work into the service, not just like layer something on top of itself. Um, and so I came up with that mode of making plaster work. Um, so what I was doing was, actually I have one on my wall. So I can see if you guys can see Sweet. We've lost your audio. Oh. So this is one of the Your audio is cutting in and out, but I think you're saying this is one of the plaster pieces. And it's a lot bigger than I was imagining. Yeah. Kind yeah. of. It sounds like your audio is being picked up like in the other room. So, are, so you're, is the whole thing plaster? Is this super heavy? Yeah. So what I was doing is I'm actually using um, uh, this plaster piece. Oh no. Um, you're using oh no, your audio is really bad. Quick, go back. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Stanzi. This is the joy of Instagram. Instagram and not all of us having television studios. Mm -hmm. I was watching a live on YouTube yesterday, and um, uh, can you hear me again? Oh my gosh, so much better. Yeah. Okay. Okay. What are I, you doing now? Your whatever. Audio is great. Yeah, you nailed yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. I just had to get rid of the Bluetooth headphones. Sorry about that, guys. No problem. Um, you were saying plaster work. So yes. So what I was doing is I have fiber, and I'm cutting the shape of this sort of figure landform out of um, a heavy felt. And then I'm laying it into a mold that I made and pouring a tinted plaster. So the blue is all a uh, plaster that's reinforced in the back. And so what are you tinting it with? So this one I was using um, a, a concrete dye that I found in Berlin. And it's getting that like speckly, like, it looks like paint, like it's a paint. I thought you painted it because it's like. Or it looks like an indigo dye. Yeah, it's so. Yeah, soft. this this dye was pretty incredible. Um, I figured out like by, it sort of had this really alchemical feel where depending on the mix of plaster and water and dye, I could get anywhere from like this light blue to like an oxidized orange, depending on how I used it. So oh. the, the show that I did for General Hardware in um, 2017, I think, was all using this exact same dye, but the range of colors was really extreme from one to the other. So this is like a, probably about 15 inches tall, this guy. So what made you want to link the um, plaster with like a felting material? Like, how did you make that connection? How did it, and how do you remove it from the plaster? You so can't, the, it's, it's embedded. Oh, okay. 
Um, <laughs> yeah, there's no removing it ever again. It's, it's it becomes one thing. Yeah, it's 100% used. Um, yeah, it was sort of a thing of trial and error. Uh, in Berlin, there's this art supply store sort of mecca called Modular. And it has everything. It's like part hardware store, part art supply store. They also have shops for casting, laser cutting, photography, like all this crazy stuff. It's, it's amazing. And when I came back to Berlin and I was preparing for the show, I knew I wanted to try to make these sculptures, but I had very little idea of how that was going to work. And I just sort of go, started going through, just kind of putting everything in a cart. And I came along this fiber and I'm just, cause I knew I wanted to create an image into the, into the plaster, but I'm not a sculptor. I didn't want, like, I didn't think carving was a thing. Um, I do have sort of a background with fabric as well because my mother's a seamstress. Mm -hmm. So I had this sort of childhood background of making things with fabric. And when I came across this industrial felt, I was like, well, maybe that, that would work. The first few were actually made with paper and like this crepe paper and those were really beautiful but way too delicate. Um, so the the sure. felt became the thing and it offers enough resist but it also completely absorbs the plaster so it becomes part of part of the piece. Okay I was like thinking you were somehow making these molds with the felt and I was like I just do not understand how she is getting this felt out of here and and making that successful because like wouldn't yeah like you're saying wouldn't it just absorb right in so I was, I, this makes a lot more sense to me yeah and I, I don't have any of them here to show you but the last um show that I did with plasters I started working into the fiber much more so there are these really intricately sewn things with like florals and like sort of foresty scenes and like I got way more into developing the plaster but it's sort of heartbreaking because like you make this thing and sometimes it's been like a few weeks sewing a piece and then you put it in the mold and you pour plaster on it and it can get destroyed in 30 seconds because if you pour the plaster the wrong way it goes underneath the oh. fiber and it just it would undo like tens of hours of work and just feel like <laughs> you can't recover it at all like it's just it's gone so when they work you're like yes and you feel this real sense of accomplishment because it's not like an oil painting where you're like, I'll just paint over it. Like Have it's, it's destroyed. Have before? Oh yeah. So okay. many times. <laughs> oh, no. Because like, I'm not a master sculptor. Like I've done this all like really DIY in my own studio. Like my molds are literally cardboard boxes with, um, uh, with um, the PVC that you use to line a shower, like in oh, them. Like yeah. I do it really ad hoc because when I was learning how to do this, I'm like, I need it to be something kind of cheap and cheerful and easy that I can do myself. Um, and I came up with this way that works and I just kind of kept going with that, but it's not at all a, like professional <laughs> mold making technique. Well, they turn out really lovely. So, Thanks. I mean, regardless of, I mean, how you get that doesn't matter. Yeah. I, you'll, yeah. And you'll get to a point where like either you'll change the method or it, you'll have less of those failures. So then you're not like hours disappeared. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think with the fiber, that's always going to be part of it. There's always going to be that risk. And I think that's part of what makes them exciting is that it is sort of this, um, really chancy surprising thing and like all those like the speckling and the work it's hard to kind of control that but mm -hmm. it's all about trying to wield it and uh being happy with the surprises that come with it so i like that you can't change it it's like it's frozen in time it's like this is what it was when i made it and that's it what do you do with the ones that don't work i shatter them and throw them away <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I'll keep them around for a while just to like mourn it, <laughs> but <laughs> then you just have to let it go because plaster is heavy and you just have all these like accumulated failures and you just have to let them go after a little while. You're like literally carrying around the weight of your failures. You carry around <laughs> the weight of your failures. Exactly. So yeah. You have uh, to let one it go. tooth says, nice to hear about your risky process. <laughs> is that, is that a relation? No, like Gwen and I are actually is. not. I have, I had an aunt named Gwen Tooth. Um, and so everyone always thought Gwen and I were related because we're the only tooth artists in Toronto. Uh, but we're not. I figured that out. <laughs> yeah. So the shift back to kind of working 
more on paper and uh, using kind of like a pen and ink. Very mm-hmm. washy. It's very, very gestural what's happening right now. Yeah, um, I can bring a few out too. Has that been part of sort of the situation of the pandemic or being a mom and wanting to be like around the house more or a combination of the two? It's definitely a combination. Um, Ever since I did all those residents, these are a few of the ones I've been working on lately. Mm -hmm. Um, It's a series that I'm working on right now. These are some deep blacks. Yeah, these are Yeah, the black is a recurrent thing that I'm getting really into. Wait, this is watercolor, right? This is ink. Okay. Because yeah. I was going to say, like, watercolor, I don't, I don't feel like you get this black with watercolor. No, I think it would be really hard to get that kind Thanks. of intense. These would be great lithographs. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Like, you know what? I've tried to do printmaking so many times, and my brain just does not work that way. I think I have to work with you and Kyle to... These would be just such beautiful um, lithographs. Yeah. Especially like all of these, so you can use like a, a touche, which I don't it, know how to describe what a that touche is. is uh, it is printer toner melted into alcohol. Okay, you can take like a little bit of water. It's like concentrated like powder pigment, and it creates these incredibly dense like sections of color. Probably a lot similar, mm, maybe not similar to like a like an ink. Because an ink is uniform, whereas this is like little tiny particles of pigment suspended in a liquid. And then when the alcohol evaporates, it rests on top of the, uh, the stone. stone. Okay. <laughs> but all of these, like if you go up close, like all of this like beautiful um, washiness, especially in the top sort of more organic space, mm-hmm. that is something that uh, like can be achieved with a touche wash, but it's like a fun... Um, experimental challenge and but when you get it oh my gosh it's just unbelievably beautiful these are so nice what kind of paper are you working on it looks- um watercolor paper so I use a really heavy watercolor paper so I can really get them quite wet and you can really layer into them in a satisfying okay kind wait, of way. Hey, oh, stop. we have a nice little comment here. yeah I have a comment I want to talk about the whiteness in this one uh, Phil Irish says, gotta go, but I'm loving the chill process dialogue. Beautiful ink, Stanzi. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll, this General will be Hardware up... says beautiful. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, we will have this up on our um, site after, so you can watch it like, later if you want to finish it up. This print is cool. Or this cool. painting. Painting, not print. <laughs> this we, is... just, we just want you to come back, Stanzi, and we want to make prints with you. <laughs> yeah, let's do it, for so sure. How, how are you getting these white bits? So that's all um, absent, like, left space. So that's where the white of the paper. Are you using that blocker or are you just working up to that area? No, I just leave it out. It's um, something that um, kind of resonates through a lot of the my past ink drawings. I, or I did um, a series of Shona General Hardware a couple of years ago um, where it's all... Um, figures left out uh, like that are left as the white space of the paper and then there's the blue surround of the landscape that kind of makes the figure um so i kind of got used to leaving this white space um i like in in the work um but then now i'm kind of doing the inverse of that with these heavy heavy blacks and sort of letting it kind of consume the space and leaving the absence that way instead of doing it as the white of the paper. Have you worked um, in just like a black and white format like this before? I've worked in monochromes quite a bit, Mm -hmm. um, but not in black and white. It's been years and years since I've done black and white work. Um, And when I was coming back to it, I was just sort of like this weird gray space of pandemic art making and not really kind of knowing where I wanted to go with the work. And I actually started trying to work in full color when I came back to the studio after my baby hiatus um but it just it didn't feel right and i find that monochromes are sort of how i end up working through ideas in a way first like i don't make preparatory work ever i kind of just go at it but um i kind of work in monochromes before i go into full color sometimes 
Okay, that makes sense. I I think that it's interesting seeing, um, like, just using the one material, because, like, the piece that we have is mono. Mm-hmm. It's all, like, shades of blue. Mm-hmm. But, I don't know if it's monochrome. Well, I think there's, there's a little like, bit of browns in it. It's, like, those complementary colors. It's, like, it, but it's pretty, like, <laughs> one color range. You would describe would it as blue. Um, but all of the, like, the layering um, with the different shades creates this, like, very dense um patterned like it's a landscape so Mm -hmm. area so i like how with these the patterning is coming out by like playing with the washes and like leaving areas like that last one that you just showed um are you doing sort of like a like a one tone layer first and then letting that dry and then going back over it again with more um saturated ink or um, no, what I'll end up doing is I'll mix like a few different tones of um, ink. I, I recycle everything. So you'll see like this is part of my little cart. So I'll have like a million jars and you'll see I'll label them like dark, medium, and I'll keep all the caps and I'll have like a million sort of saturations of um, ink with water. Nice. And I just kind of go at it. So I do the whole surface all at once. Usually I'm never it's very rare that I'm kind of going back into stuff um, afterwards. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it's sort of like a, a weird thing where I've always kind of dealt with the service of things all in in one go, kind of. So I'll kind of go back in with the black maybe a little bit afterwards, but um, I kind of have a range of tones that I'm working with first rather than kind of um, layering them up later. So can we get a little walkthrough of what your studio is like? And has this changed a lot, like, from the studios you've worked with in the past? Oh, yeah, 100%. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've been working from home. I have have this office studio space that I'm sharing with my partner. So this is my handy-dandy drafting table. So it's an oversized drafting table. It's about six feet wide. Um, and, yeah, so it's a, we've kind of got dueling drafting tables here my partner is a designer and illustrator that's our kyle topping piece actually over I his love desk. It. that's awesome <laughs> this was oops sorry the sun is kind of getting in the way here but uh this is his birthday gift he's like loves this screen print so oh, i'm so glad it's over his desk oh that's awesome um but yeah i was working i had a very like industrial painting studio space um, but with the baby, just made the decision that I couldn't really do the shared studio mm-hmm. thing um, right now. And there's just sort of no end in sight. So I started working from home more exclusively. And I've got these like bins of fiber stuff that I've kind of left off to the side for now. So um, our apartment will kind of get overtaken by fiber work every once in a while. But I do all the ink work at my table. Are you doing the plaster casting at home too? I'm not doing that at all right now. It's way too messy of a process <laughs> to do from home. But I've been working on some fiber pieces that will get cast later. Um, I'm planning on my, we've been bubbled with my parents over the pandemic who live actually not far from you guys in oh. Bath, oh, yeah. Ontario. Um, so our plan is to spend some more time there this summer. And I sort of in the summers will take over their barn as a, studio space too so i'm planning on doing some messy work this summer when we're there that sounds i mean it's nice too to kind of be like okay this is going to be when that happens and you just have this like concentrated focus time on that particular project and you can Mm -hmm. get everything prepped and ready and then also i'm sure with parents that are just like we haven't seen our little grandson in forever they can kind of get infatuated over her that and you can yep. be outside working <laughs> yeah it's a, sort of my plan of like a residency with built-in child care so yes, it'll be right. great <laughs> we can't offer that for you no. I'll, i mean for maybe 15 minutes and then i'll be like okay i got other stuff to do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all of you look yeah. adorable um i think we got another little comment uh, Kyle. studio had said uh love the space totally understand the mom artist struggle yeah, the struggle is real for sure. But um, we're really lucky to have this space. And um, the other part of the space is our art book. Amazing. So on, on, library. That, on that oh question, yeah. like, how, 
have you like worked at a schedule you're like from like nine to like 10 at night I get to work in the studio like how are you navigating well we're lucky that our baby is an amazing sleeper so he'll go down at lucky. like 6 30 7 o'clock at night and he's out for the whole night so like what the night's... what, what? Yeah. pardon me <laughs> that's amazing <laughs> don't tell anyone um yeah, I mean, like, every once in a while, there would be, like, a thing. But, like, for the last several months, he's sleeping through the night, which is incredible. So then I have my nights to let loose and do work. That's amazing. Which yeah. is weird for me because I used to be, like, a morning person big time. And, like, that was my time to work. But I'm getting used to working in the evening instead. Well, take what you can get. Yeah. Exactly. If you get to work all night or at least, like, a chunk of the night, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So do you have like a regular practice? You're like in the studio five days a week right now? We're trying to? Five days a week is hard sometimes after yeah. running after him all day long, but I'm trying to do like four nights a week kind of thing right now and that's working so my way up as he gets as he gets older. Yeah. yeah. So that's my hope. Some weeks is harder than others. So teething really puts a kink in things too, but <laughs> so. It just seems like I couldn't. I just couldn't. The end. <laughs> That's the end of that thought. You, you figure it out when you have to, but yeah, it's a transition or an adjustment for sure. Um, do we want to jump into show and tell? Unless anybody has any more questions about studio space, pop them in and I'm, we can clarify yeah. anything. That book of that book wall is amazing. I'm like loving. Yeah, yeah. The this glory is... of that. Yeah. But we can dive into some shares. Some shares. So we have two artworks to share with you. Sure. So you can go first, or we can go first. It is I'll... your choice. Um, I'll sh I'll share something. So yeah. I have a bunch of work from like our collection to share, but I thought it'd be fun to share Winston, my son's first artwork in his what? collection. Pardon? Pardon me. Oh, <laughs> <not> <laughs> he actually has a it's growing art, art collection. collection. Okay. But I have I to frame like, this one still. I thought you meant he made this, and I was like, oh, no, 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 not at genius. all, no. no. And also, how is he so dexterous already? I mean, he is a genius, <laughs> but um, he did not make this. Um, Jessica Bell made this for him. Oh, this um, is And we have gorgeous. to frame it. Yeah, so Jessica Bell is an amazing painter, artist, sculptress, um, what have you, who I went to graduate school with. Um, and this is a series of works. She um, moved to Amsterdam recently, and she's been doing a series. Um, this is letter sized. So making these sort of visual letters to people in her life oh. um, and mailing them. So they're all like letter sized. They can be sent through the mail. And so this was made for Winston as part of his, for his, for his nursery. So we have to frame that and put it in his room. But is it a yeah. watercolor? So it's it's mixed media, like watercolor. I think there might be some acrylic in these sort of heavier yeah. um, pieces in the bottom, but at the top is definitely sort of like a more watery. But they're um, cut papers. You can see, like, there's mm -hmm. a bit of depth to it. Oh, neat. Yeah. The, I love this color combination. Like, mm -hmm. the top being so subdued, but then the orange and the pink just being so like loud by comparison is really nice. Yeah. She's an amazing colorist. Yeah. I really like that a lot. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's super nice. Yeah. We, that's what was the name again? Jessica, Bell? Jessica Bell. Okay. Lovely. That's beautiful. Um, our first share is a sweet little screen print. Oh, nice. Two-color screen print that I'm fairly certain we picked up at a printmaking conference that we've talked about many times called uh, Southern Graphics. And I believe the name of the printer is Irina Pearl. I hope that I'm saying that correctly, the first name. And honestly, I don't know um, that much about this printmaker. And I did try to um find them online and i th think that i did but i i can't say for certain that the information i'm about to share is actually in connection to the person that made this print because this we probably got quite a few years ago so it's not 
up online anywhere. So I don't know if it was just something that was made specifically for the conference. And so there's no record of it. Um, but the person that I did find with that name, who is a printmaker, which seems like a pretty good lead, um, runs a shop with, I'm assuming their partner in Poughkeepsie, New York, uh, called Yuki Pearl. And it looks like it is kind of a combination ceramics and letterpress studio, but with some really beautiful textile. So even if it's not the same artist, I love this little screen print, but I really like the work that's on this print, this like shops page. So regardless, both shares are great. Hopefully they're connected or I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who this print is by. Um, but yeah, I was looking at their Instagram page and they have some like really nice textiles, but then they, um, they also have some beautiful clay work, which seems to maybe be more the focus right now is the clay, uh, which it seems like both herself and uh, her partner work in. Um, and then the letterpress seems to be kind of a subcategory and the textiles all look like they're block printed. So doing like nice. flat block printing and then sewing into just like really gorgeous looking garments. Hmm. But who knows if they're the same, regardless, this print is adorable. The printmaking world's pretty small. I think it's, it, it seems, <laughs> it seems plausible, but it's always a little nerve wracking when you're like, oh, I think so. Um, but this little print is just so simple and so cheery. And it looks way brighter in the camera than it does. It's a little bit duller. Like the, the lime green is a little bit kicked back in real life. Mm. But... Yeah, the camera's picking it up almost as a fluorescent. But it has this nice feel. Yeah. Like you can really feel the ink sitting on top of the surface. Nice. So yeah, That's that is share. share number one. Awesome. What do you got next? Okay. Um, this is one of my prides and joy. This is a painting by Kim Dorland. I am so jealous right now. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, I had the privilege of having Kim as a prof, like one of the very few classes he taught at OCAD um, on my, in my last year. And we ended up doing a trade for this. Um, yeah. I think I got the better end of the deal. <laughs> um, no, and your work is amazing. Thanks. Uh, but yeah, I love this painting. And I have an even bigger connection to it now because the title of it is New Father. And he made this right after his first son was born. Aww. And um, yeah, so this painting gives me all the feels these days. But, Kim's yeah, so work is so great it's beautiful so it's um spray painting and acrylic in the back and then this really heavy impasto oil painting in the front yeah his work is really characterized by that day glow orange or, or that like, like fluorescent, fluorescent pink. pink fluorescent pink underpainting yeah 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 and always like kind of like your work like this idea of like um your relationship with landscape and mm -hmm. people's connection and like how they make space in sort of these more wild places. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it makes, I think it makes sense for you to own one of Kim's works. Yeah. I love this piece. And uh, yeah. Yeah. And also I love when uh, his work gets like really heavy, those portraits that he was doing, mm -hmm. I don't know if he's still doing them, but he was a few years ago where it's just like, like almost a sculpture. <laughs> yeah, and this painting, I think, is really, like, right at the beginning of that period in his work. And you can see that in the, oh, in yeah. his, this is a self-portrait, and you can see that in the face of this little painting. So this is 11 by, 16 by 20, I believe. Okay. Um, but it already has some notes of, and, like, the same with the treatment of the trees in the foreground, has some of that energy from those portraits. What an awesome trade. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I got pretty lucky with that one. I think so good. Yeah. All right, our second share is this kind of psychedelic trippy piece um, by I'm going to say like interdisciplinary artist um, Jackie. I'm going to say Jackie's last name. I just know it's going to be wrong. Uh, Huskinson? Hutchinson? I'm not sure. Jackie, I'm sorry. I'm, Jackie has definitely told me how to say 
her name and I still am, am failing. Um, but this is a screen print that uh, she made while she was here. I don't even know when that would have been quite a few years back now. Jackie stayed with us a couple times and this kind of became like a repeated piece. I'm not sure if this one became a wallpaper, but definitely during one of Jackie's stays, a lot of wallpaper was being made. And her work really is, I would say, heavily installation focused. So mm. usually there's a lot of like ink um, drawings or screen prints of some sort that are displayed in conjunction with e either like a performative part or projections so a lot a lot of the like recent work has been kind of um these collections of images a lot of them referencing um the body different parts of the bodies um like the way that you move certain parts of your bodies in connection with projection so imagine kind of like pieces at different scales so paper works at different scales on a wall um, almost like a puzzle hmm. and then projection either on top of those paper pieces or beside them kind of connecting the works together so really like interesting and lovely combination of um, material practice and they the projections are often like animated versions of the drawings wow mm -hmm. yeah but, there's so much movement in there yeah. So this one's like really animal, which is like not really what uh, Jackie's work looks like now. Most of the recent work I was checking out is um, like hands, mouths. So like a little bit like the teeth of this, like mouths open with a lot of teeth showing. Um, hands kind of doing strange gestures feet tapping, that kind of thing. So just simple gestures, but all kind of isolated in these little segments and placed together uh, in a space. I think this blue is slightly metallic-y. Yes, yeah, okay. it was a pearlescent. A pearlescent, there you go. So you can see how it kind of picks oh, yeah. up light a little bit. Nice. So it has this really interesting kind of texture when you look at it, and it catches that light and makes those that blue part of the pattern really, really kind of jump forward amazing yeah i just love how wild this piece is oh it's crazy wild well and those colors really jump off of each other so much too mm -hmm. and it's one of those pieces like from a distance you can't really tell what's going on like it just mm -hmm. feels like it looks I, like a roar shark almost yeah. yeah and then when you get closer it's like all of this information starts popping out at you wow when Jackie first came, uh, she had done a residency, I believe it was a residency in, um, I want to say Ireland. I'm probably really messing this up. It's been a long time. And so this is strictly from memory. But she had made a costume, like, um, like kind of like a cosplay costume of like a cat creature <laughs> that um, she had designed and she got like a proper costume maker to create this costume and that was part of the application man i like killed me i was like this is am like i've never Amazing. even thought about creating a character and then having a costume maker make it so then i could wear it that blew my <laughs> mind i was like how have i never known of this possibility before in my life it was great that's awesome so that's our second share awesome okay I'm kind of moving around to my home because I'm showing you guys stuff that's hanging up in I love house. it. So this is a painting by Rob Davidovitz. Yes. Rob stayed with us. Yes. I love Rob. Rob and I were studio mates um, for a couple of years before I went to graduate school. Um, I absolutely love this painting. This is from his last show. Um, and Rob does really sculptural paintings. So each of these are actually strands that have been squeezed out individually and then he makes these compositions and if you get in close you can see where he's left sort of the pock marks and the bubbling in the paint itself can we see the bottom the bottom edge yes and so he leaves the beautiful sort of yes. oh, frayed so bottom awesome. edge 
And he's gotten really great with the armatures on these pieces. I actually have to rehang it because it's a little crooked because it's not, it's not um, a completely square piece, obviously. And so it makes it impossible to hang it level because I'm used to leveling everything perfectly. And this just doesn't want to be level in my home. It's like kind of that bordering between sculptural and painting, right? Mm hmm And I actually, I can quickly show you, I have um, another piece of his hanging in our home, which is a really nice compliment in our bedroom. Oh, yeah. So this is his earlier work, which is more reminiscent of what he was doing when he was with you guys, I think. Yeah. Um, I think this one is the same pattern as those prints he was doing with you guys. I think so, actually. Yeah. So this was the OG piece that <laughs> inspired that series. I traded him for this when we were studio mates, and I absolutely love it. So basically, because um, he didn't work on any of this type of work when he was with us. So he is he piping them out like you would like if you were a baker where you yeah like so, ink is or the acrylic paint i'm pretty sure is going into like a piping bag yes it is so you can see like each of these strands like each line is a strand of paint that's been piped out and so what he's doing is he's mixing the paint in the piping bag to get these gradients so he'll have a piping bag with like a white and different grays and a black or with the colored ones different colors and then they mix into a gradient as he pipes it out. So it's kind of this crazy thing where he's planning out the gradients for each individual strand and then planning out the gradients for the weaving as well. Maybe we should ask him to be on the Wait, show. So, okay. <laughs> is he like is weaving so the things nuts. or is he? He is, like... they're physically woven, yeah. Does yeah, he do actually, that while it's wet or does he let it dry out first? And then... No, each of the strands dries out. And actually he uses um, baking trays like a baker too to dry them all out. <laughs> it's this very baking centric practice. Um, but yeah, he uses these baking trays to dry out each of the strands and then weaves them all into this composition. Oh, yeah, um, cool. yeah, and actually when we were studio mates, um, he was in a car accident. Oh, But he had this massive show coming up and um, I offered to help him weave a piece. And I thought I was doing a really great job. And then halfway through the pattern, I realized that I was off by one and I'd completely oh, messed up no. the whole thing. And like to this day, I feel really guilty about it. So, oh. but yeah, well, but yeah, know. Rob's work is incredible. And I, I love those pieces. Actually, Stanzi, thinking about the fact that you've mentioned a few studio mates now and mm -hmm. also like traveling around to different studios, what's the experience been like, like where you are like in one, not traveling to go to a different space to work and yep. two, not having, I mean, I know you have your partner as a studio mate, but mm -hmm. it's different than having someone who's literally just a studio mate or an, or another artist friend of yours. What's that been like? Um, yeah, I mean, I really miss that connection for sure. Um, I was sharing um, my last studio with Howard Lawn and Amanda Bullos and like Howard and I worked on the same schedule. Um, and yeah, it's too bad, like not having that sort of day to day interaction um, with them. But you just kind of do what you can like have virtual studio visits with people. Um, I also am bubbled with my friend Liz Peed. I have one of her pieces as a share for you as well. Ooh. I actually have a, like a whole bunch of uh, old um, studio mate work. <laughs> That's how I, I love it. accumulate. <laughs> <laughs> I like wear people down and eventually take their work home with me. Um, but um, no, I trade them for it. But, yeah. I was going to say, I highly doubt that's the case, but. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so Liz has been sort of a touchstone through this whole thing. And Winston and I will go to her studio every once in a while with her just to like oh, nice. get out. She was, uh, I was actually using her studio to do some of the big um, tapestry pieces last summer because, or like the summer before last, because she's set up for fiber. She's a weaver. Ooh. fiber artist also does painting she's sort of a jack of all trades but her studio is really set up for fiber work in a big way oh that's nice it's nice to have that connection too mm -hmm. some of the pieces look quite large that you've been working on yeah yeah like they're up to like six and a half feet yeah. long and i just don't have a clean space big enough because like that's the thing with fiber as soon as it touches paint or anything else it's kind of it's, it's in trouble so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> has a different impact 
then mm -hmm. what's the piece that you have of hers yes oops the lighting in here is okay um so this is one of her copper landscapes so this is on like a copper mesh and it's actually oh. a stitch landscape oh, wow. yeah these are really incredible this is a teeny tiny one i think it's like the piece itself is maybe like eight inches wide that's that super is cool. so nice. I didn't realize yeah. that, the copper had, that you could get copper mesh this fine, but I guess that kind of makes sense for like plumbing supplies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so she's done much larger ones that are really amazing, but I love sort of, it's just like with small paintings, how like the mark of a single stitch like becomes so much more impactful on this scale. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like there's just such a like Doing small suggestion copper. on copper. I've, yeah. I've never seen that before. Yeah, yeah, I find they're really unique. I really love them. Yeah, there's something interesting about that, uh, the luminosity of the copper shining back from behind mm -hmm. the surface. Yeah, it has that kind of feeling of like a sunset sort of on, on, in the landscape off of water. Yeah, I really love it. Uh, Mary says it's also available as a craft material. The copper is? Oh. I, I did, did not, not know, know that. that. No, yeah. I didn't know that either. And I'd be like, what kind of plumbing stuff do you have? <laughs> I would have not even known. I would have had to Google search, like, copper mesh. Where do you buy this? Because I've never seen copper mesh ever. I don't really even know what that is. I mean, I can see it, but mm -hmm. I don't understand what its function would be. That is neat. I really like that. Yeah, it's beautiful. Thanks, yeah. Mary, for that little tip. Who knew? <laughs> oh, such nice. I, I actually kind of like that you have the work up in the house. We, ha we had um, Arden Way, who is a photographer, and she took us basically, like, literally oh, around her true. house, um, mm -hmm. which is, yeah, we have, like, because Kyle and I have, like, mics and we're kind of, like, wired up to a tripod we we just bring everything out but it's nice to see like how things are hung and yeah that it actually like lives with you in the space is such a nice element yeah that's actually been mine and Keith's like covid pandemic project is getting a lot of the art hung in our home and like framing some things and um like you can see in our bedroom like we've got a sort of installation of work happening nice. um, but just living with a lot more artwork around our home we've got like a collection of small things there um but but yeah that, like you fall in love with and it's really it's really interesting when you start living with them mm -hmm. like they're not on an exhibition they're not in a gallery space they're not having a dialogue with other stuff they're like you know beside you when you're going to the bathroom <laughs> yep. they're in your hallway or yep. they're in your bedroom and you sleep with it and like i think that there's something really wonderful about what kind of art people select for their spaces mm -hmm. I think that, like, you know, I think that Kim Dorland one was, like, immediately right to your left of your desk. Yep. Right? It's, like, having things like that that make you feel really excited when you're, like, working in a space. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, I mean, and most of the work we have is connected to people that we know and care about or, like, memories of places. So it's, it all has that, um, that tone to it as well. Yeah, it's like that little touchstone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not only looking at a piece that's like lovely, but it's also bringing you back to a time or a place or a person that meant something or yeah, mm -hmm. like that. I like that a lot. I also just like that one Rob piece. I'm, I'm now I want one. <laughs> yeah, this work is <laughs> like, incredible. I really, really like, I haven't seen, um, I've seen like the, them on the website, obviously, but having you move the camera around and get a bit more sense of a the scale of it because it's hard sometimes to read that but mm -hmm, also the um, <laughs> density of the material the mm -hmm. vertical stripe one like i i i don't know how many tubes of paint that is it's a lot of paint though yeah he definitely buys in bulk um <laughs> but yeah just i mean what's incredible is like you can see so much little detail just in the body of the paint itself and there is um, such a delicate so like between like the left side and the right side like the 
the gradation of that red. Oh, I just love mm-hmm. it. The green, like or blue, I think. Or blue, like it's just it's really well done. It's also like really like that's got to be really hard to do. We nicknamed this piece Colgate. Yeah, yes. <laughs> I was thinking it. I didn't want to say it. <laughs> Rob has allowed us to call it okay. Colgate, so it's okay. We got permission. But Keith and I call this painting Colgate because it looks like the most like luminous toothpaste um, <laughs> frozen it's in time. Oh my gosh. I'm glad that you said it. I was like, you don't say it because you don't say it. Yeah. I worked at a gallery in this um, ceramicist who did just, oh my gosh, the ceramics that she made were unbelievable. Mm. But she did a series that were uh, was made out of paper clay, and they they really looked like different types of like coral and mm. like sort of seaweed. They have a, they had a very like oceanic feel to them, which was one hundred percent not her like plan intention. Yeah, and everybody was just like couldn't not see it that way and it really annoyed her so much and so yeah I was I'm always like trying to not like immediately go to the place that like oh this might not be what you were aiming for but it really looks like that no I think (laughs) Rob's pretty playful about his work in general so it's permissible I think I like that 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 makes it less stressful in (laughs) Oh, this has been such a delightful chat and um, just really good shares. I'm like quite envious of your collection. So thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank thanks for having me. Thank you so much. And I really like love what you're working on right now. Thank you so much. The I was, when I first, I think I like um, saw one of the ink pieces came up on Instagram for me and I was like, oh black and white and then I like kind of started devouring what you've been posting and I yeah I don't know I like think that that is such an interesting shift and a nice um a nice way to explore texture in a new way that is fun to watch and see yeah I'm oh sorry go ahead no no you go ahead I was gonna say I'm about to start some larger ones of those and I'm like excited about what scale is going to do Mm. to them so Oh yeah. Oh, I will I will look forward to seeing that. Sweet. Thanks Amazing. so much, Danzy. Thank you guys. Have a super lovely weekend. Yes, you too. Yeah. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye.